hello and welcome. It's so good to see you all here. Hopefully you had um, a couple of good discussions. I know we had um, some good social lounging. I'll just put it that way. Um, and really that also lead into this discussion. So I'm Liz Lemke and I am so excited uh, to introduce to you Trond Morten Torset. Um, he can um, say that much better in Norwegian than I can. Um, as we to really talk about um, what are some of the things that get in the way of us learning and um, things that we can't ignore, but oftentimes are those elephants in the room that never get discussed that people know about. Um, and how can we, when we're bringing attention to them, understand how can we move forward? How can we address it? How can we deal with it? So Trond, I'm so excited to have you here. And you also have an interesting shift into this area around learning. And so we're excited to hear your story and your thoughts. Thank you, Liz. And good evening, everybody. Um, as you said, my name is Trond Morten Torset, and um, I'm going to share some of my experiences from teaching at uh, Norwegian University of Science and Tech Technology. Um, right now, it's the middle of the winter here, uh, mm. outside. The temperature outside is something like 40 degrees Celsius, less than in my living room. So, but it's beautiful, located in the middle of Norway. So, as a physicist, I have invested a lot in trying to understand my students. And in particular, one of the interests is how do they learn? And when you look out in the lecture hall, you very often start thinking, what is actually going on out there? You see a lot of poker faces, but what is actually going on out there. So this question has been bugging me for some time. And I've been working with response technology. And using this kind of response technology, can we get some more information? And since I've been working with the technology, we also pushed the idea of getting text in there so we can ask questions where they respond with text. That gives us a deeper understanding of uh, or possibilities to, to open up a lot of new questions. So using the technology, can I dive in a lecture hall into the group and, and figure out what is going on out there? So one of the simplest questions you can ask a person is, how are you doing? Normally, you don't do that in a lecture hall. But using this kind of technology, it's kind of easy. On a scale from 1 to 10, how are you today? And the students respond quite easily. And this shows a typical response from uh, one course that I was teaching. These are young people in the age from 18 to 25 years old, typically. They are changing their career path from being electricians or uh, some hairdressers who wants to become engineers. They, they're just changing their learning path. And uh, then they have to go to some qualification course in mathematics and physics and such things. So what you see here in the blue bars is this group responding after one week in my room. <clears throat> and I ask them the same questions four weeks later. You see the, sh the shift and you see these red bars with this improvement in how they are thriving in class has changed. So getting to know each other, relaxing a little bit more, you see an improvement. But you also see somebody moving down. Something happens here. And the interesting things happens because what is what does this mean? What does it mean that a student is at eight? What does it mean that a student is at four, which is quite low? We really don't know. So then, using this same kind of technology, I'm asking them the magic wand questions. If I could take away one thing in your life, what would it be that makes your life better? And combining these responses with the, from the previous questions with the text responses, then we start to see what is going on here. And this is just an example from the same class, uh, those who Respondent six on the blue bars. You have the funny guys who is slightly hangover. You have these who haven't had breakfast. But then you also start to start to find these people who want to have somebody to work with, who want to have more friends, 
or their boyfriend is not around, which is kind of painful. And um, if we move down the scale, um, being present with the flu, of course, that doesn't make learning fun. Uh, but you see again, this magic word socially, nothing else, kind of critical. Getting to know more people, yes, I really understand that if you don't have much friends in the room, that's kind of troublesome. And then even going further down, there were three persons responding. Two of them didn't respond anything to me. One of them gave me this critical message, it's not possible to fix it now. And that student had a horrible story. And that story, is not, it's not one I'm going to tell right now. Uh, but that student tried to pass this course three times. And she never managed to pass. And that's the one who ended up uh, down at the scale of two later on here. But that's another story. Uh, asking these questions time after time throughout the year with different classes, with different groups of students, I start to see there is a pattern. It's very much the same. You see it very often. There is something related to social aspects. Somebody to work with. You have friends who die. You have social anxiety in there. The sensation of not really fitting in. Um, somebody I know just killed himself. My parents just divorced or hard to make friends. All of these are really serious issues that if you're having this in your life, it's close to your life, then learning is hard. And it's, of course it's present. It's present in life and it's present with student. So meeting this, uh, we see thoughts trigger feelings and feelings trigger thoughts. What, what is what? This is kind of messy for young people. But can I do something that helped? Because I know this feeling of being such an idiot, or why do I never do this better? Why do I never get better at presenting online? These kind of thoughts just run through your head every time in everybody's head. So one way of attacking this was trying to say, what happens if I talk about my weird things going on in the head. What if we try to normalize what's going on? So whenever I do a mistake as a physics or a math teacher, um, you, you occasionally do mistakes on the blackboard. And hearing that students become restless, uh, you're hearing that they're making comments, something is going on and your head is kidnapped immediately. Uh, it's very, very hard to focus on something uh, when part of my working memory is doing something else. And this social awareness, being aware that everybody else is watching me, being aware that they kind of they might be criticizing me, that takes away a lot of my brain capacity in this scenario. So what happens if I just stop, rewind what's going on, and tell them exactly what happens in here. This is what's going on in my brain right now. And one of the things that fascinates me in here is that this paper of Bernard Rimet, uh, Emotion Elicits the Social Sharing of Emotions. Uh, we have this commercially in Norway saying that lateral makes people talk, but the real truth is emotions makes people talk. And when you look at the learning scenarios, the situations, being there, it's, a lot, it's associated with a lot of feelings. You're supposed to feel the frustration. You're supposed to be lost from time to time. You're tired. Your uncertainty is present all the time. And sometimes you also have this kind of excitement and joy. But there's a lot of emotions present in there. And this paper also says it quite explicit, if you have negative emotions, and you have a lot of them when you deal with learning, most people do, because you are frustrated, you're struggling. And if it's too easy, then, then you're not really working with relevant stuff. It has to be 
somehow a battle with uh, what you know and, and to, to have efficient development. But these negative emotions that's there, they fuel a lot of cognitive work. And a lot of that cognitive work stimulates thoughts where you start to compare yourself with others. You, you start to make explanations why you're there, what happened now, and you feel the urge to talk to somebody. And uh, right now, there is not too many students around to talk to. So this is, this is one of the problematic things right now, to being a student. But just these basic questions, how are you? Uh, when you do interviewing students afterwards and, and listen to what they say, it, it creates a lot of awareness that, oh, I'm not the only one. Uh, whenever I do assessments and we kind of share all the results immediately with the same digital systems, they can see how they're doing compared to everybody else. As, as one student said that this is so beautiful because I don't have to run and ask everybody else how they were doing. So this urge to compare is there, but seeing how others are doing, seeing what others are saying, opening up, normalizing, asking questions and bringing it up using this kind of technology seems to feel like kind of relaxing for the students. And it, it strikes me how this kind of feeds somehow the need to compare to others, the need to talk, and, and it's a very efficient way of doing that. Another thing when it comes to learning is that learning can be fast, really fast. But in particular, as a physics teacher or when I teach maths, teach mathematics, I always say that you have to focus on understanding. And if you don't understand, you will have problems. But a lot of students still cram a lot. But what happens if you don't understand? And, and understanding what happens if you really don't understand is um, this paper. I'm going to use that because it's a nice way of explaining what happens if you don't understand. Uh, and it's, I'm going to use a couple of figures from that one. If you look at this picture, for most people who have never seen what it is, it doesn't make sense at all. It's just black and white spots on the screen, nothing else. And I can learn, give you something uh, and show you that you can learn within a split second. Because if I go here and here, this picture gives complete new meaning for you. Only a fragment of a second, understanding something, your brain, somehow see something else. But it really doesn't. It sees exactly the same. It's the same information going to the back of your head from your eyes. So there is something else going on here. And this is what is explained in this paper, that understanding or seeing something depends on both what you see and some signal from the higher order of the brain. So you fill in and you create a visual understanding based on two signals, from what you see and from what you understand. So one of the most important things here then is if you don't understand it, you're actually not going to see the same thing. So this is from my class today. Um, if you understand it, it makes a lot of sense. If not, you just see a wall of some strange things. So in learning, then these questions becomes very, very important. How do you make sure that you really have understood? How can you make sure? Because you can be really sure that if you don't understand what's going on, you don't have access to the same kind of information. So thinking about this question, how can you make sure? And one of my suggestions for, for my students is, you have peer students, use them. 
check out, ask questions, use this discussion, to be able to talk about the subject and figure out, have I really understood this? Or help each other in that discussion. But again, this seems to be so hard to do. And a lot of students, they really, after even after six weeks in the same room, sitting there every day, they don't even want to ask the person next, uh, next uh, sitting in, in the chair next to them, because they are afraid that this question might be stupid. Somehow we have a system in our brain where we want to show off how good we are at having learned. But being in this situation, learning is something else. And going in and, and challenge what happens if I try and allow myself to be stupid. This takes a lot. Uh, and you really have to get to know yourself fighting this uh, feeling of presenting yourself as the best. Because this is always what happens. When I start the class and people start to be afraid of asking questions, I always try to, 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 rem to remind them that they're not in my class because they know what's going on. They're in my class because they don't know the subject. That means everybody is kind of like an idiot. Everybody is battling the same things. And we are here because we want to know it. So showing off, being the best, okay, that's one thing. But you don't have to be that while you're learning. So in this situation, everybody is vulnerable in such a learning situation. Everybody is having these kind of things going to their head. And it's, it's everywhere. Um, using response technology, making it available so everybody can see that these things are present in the room, normalizing these kind of strange ideas that we have, um, talking about it, how these can be filtered away. I don't believe in every thought my brain comes up with because a lot of them are just plain stupid. So normalizing it that is happening in my brain seems to also open up that a lot of students dare to talk about it. And the magic effect is that the students get much better at regulating these uh, learning emotions that we see in this learning situation. So this is my story. So, um, and I'm leaving it at that. Thank you. Just unhiding myself. I love it. So one of the things that we were talking about um, here is that aspect of how do we encourage and also going through those things. So there's a question here. Um, what suggestions do you have to elicit authentic questions from learners? Besides building trust, rapport with learners, especially in a quick class or one time session where you don't have weeks of trust leading up to that session. One of the things that I really see is that uh, you have to take this idea of feedback um, seriously, and it's a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And when you come up with something that you are curious about, yeah. and you start asking questions, you get feedback. But using technology like this, you don't really understand the feedback immediately because you are in front of a lot of students. Yeah. But following it up and starting to be curious about what is actually going out there. Mm. Um, but getting those questions out from the learners, mm -hmm. you have to somehow train them to ask the questions and train them to really see the purpose of the questions. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I had this good question today in an online class uh, sent from the same living room. Uh, and I just took it and I, you have to, um, I'm struggling with the word, uh, say that you really like them to ask questions. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. 
uh, yeah, uh, and and see how you see the value of the question. And and I'm all but this is a damage from partly doing coaching because then you use a lot of questions. And I know it's beneficial for me to respond to the question because that gives me a good feeling of being in control. Yeah. But I'm not the one who is learning. Exactly. So, so talking about how the question creates thoughts somewhere else and all the benefits from good questions, how they can create a lot of things, much more than yeah. me telling something digested. People are not aware of this, I think. Mm -hmm. Did that ask it, answer the question? Um, yes, I believe so. So I think, you know, it's here, it goes back to that old adage of are we teaching a man to fish <laughs> or are we giving the fish? And it's it's not, and I think one of the things, and we can take this back to leaders, et cetera, around what is that ego in terms of how are we really enabling a strong team of you know, um, Elliot uh, Maisie mentioned it yesterday is, am I passing the mic? Um, and so oftentimes it's, <laughs> you know, if you've understood it and you have the comprehension, we know you can do it. It's how are you passing the mic and, and how is someone taking on that mic and understanding, okay, here, how am I learning and, and going from that, that um, knowledge competence to the actual then capability of being able to do it um, and like you said, that was explain it to your peers. Mm -hmm. no, but but I, I also sometimes teach teamwork for mm -hmm. big classes, like 400 students, and uh, asking very personal questions about how do you think in such a scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, the students respond a lot, and it, cre it creates a lot of activity mm -hmm. when you see all these different responses that students have. When you get out this variability which is in there, because somehow we think that all students is, is just like me. Yeah. So, and, and opening up, um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things going on when you can use this technology, in particular now when you have to teach online. Mm -hmm. Creating a sense of we're in this together. So, yes, there's, yeah. you know, we're exactly. all in different boats, but we are, in the, you know, we're kind of in the same storm. So yeah. how do you get that that sense of, I mean, camaraderie is one word for it, but the other sense, it's it's perhaps even more, I'm not alone, or this aspect of, I love the question of, you know, learning can be fast, but what if you don't understand? It's it's so that that statement within itself is so beautiful because it it really is that. I don't want to be the one, I don't want to embarrass myself that I'm not the one who didn't understand it, but to see, and you know, anytime we have multiple people who don't understand it, we, we showed the video yesterday of the, the educator doing a spelling bee with his children with all these fake words for an April Fool's and you know, them being really frustrated until they realized, ah, oh, we're all frustrated, we all can't come along. And then there's this real <laughs> impact of that social noise going together. But it's, you know, am I willing to be an outsider Seeing that others are outsider, it builds that that trust. Um, this is also a battle being a teacher because somehow you want to show off. I'm, I'm a part of the university. I'm a physicist. This is the standard. This is this is where we are working. Mm -hmm. But taking it seriously, there's a pathway up there, and you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if I'm really going down to the nitty gritty details of all the stupidity going on here, mm -hmm. because I have to filter it out. Yeah. And mm -hmm. learning is also starting at all these stupid things from the beginning. That has to be filtered out. Yeah. And not just present the perfect line of, or the spherical symmetrical problems that we normally teach uh, in physics. Yeah. Well, and to say, you know, how are things interconnected? Tron's going to laugh because I keep bringing in this old book from 1904 from Catherine. <laughs> Amy, you may, <laughs> you may know it, but it's that aspect of how are things interconnected? And we've, you know, particularly with Taylor's and we, we separated things out so that the context was really missing. So how are we, it's very hard to understand things when they're so completely separated. So, 
really helping build that context also builds the understanding, which also builds also uh, confidence in terms of how we can see it. Um, there's a great comment here. This makes me think about, about how our current K through 12 US education system is constructed, evaluated around testing, not true, authentic learning. I can just rem remind you about this book. Um, how can we reimagine what learning could be starting in schooling and then in the professional world? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we need to be going, um, really around it's not cheating, we're working together. And so it's, it's it's looking beyond. So. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges for universities in higher education is the problem of feedback. Mm. Uh, but taking feedback seriously as a dialogue between the unit of uh, like the faculty and yeah. the students, it means that you have to have some sort of a dialogue and understanding. And, and listening to dumb things going on, these stupid emotional battles that students have, it also helps them getting more autonomous in, uh, in their way of working. It's, it's not a problem at all. It's actually beneficial. Absolutely. So um, it, gets, it gets the noise down somehow. It really does. And it's interesting to see the effect of it. Yeah. Well, love it. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of the great comments. Wonderful. And this will definitely continue. Um, thank you so much, Tron, for coming on. Okay, good night. Thanks, everyone.